All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the final panel of this forum. This panel will be undeniable and not unsolvable, other ways forward. You might remember my reference to a pattern earlier where in the past and yesterday we discussed the law, the theory, the past of the atrocities. But today, like the last panel, really is about other ways forward and the future. And as such, this will really be the deep dive of this topic. Today, your moderator of choice will be none other than Laurel Baig. She is a lady that I have known for a few years now when I was just but an intern at the MICT OTP. And I worked with her then, and I worked with her now, and each time it has been a pleasure. Before I hand over to her, I would like to have us see the motion again. This is the last one, so. The world is moving in the right direction when addressing genocide denial. Agree or disagree? Please cast your votes, as always, until the end of the panel. And now over to my colleague and friend, Laurel. Take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you more generally to the Academy for bringing us all together in this very special place and for your hard work in organizing this event. As a genocide prosecutor, my immediate focus, the immediate focus of my work is to seek justice in the face of horrific crimes and to work on behalf of the survivors, Munira Subasic and Honore Gatera and the count countless others that they so fearlessly represent. But justice is only one step in the longer road towards a peaceful future. Because prevention is the overarching imperative of the Genocide Convention. And this is the work that's championed by the unparalleled Alice Warimo Ndritu and her dedicated team. We've spent the last two days seeking to understand the harms of genocide denial and the legal options available to regulate or criminalize it. But this panel goes beyond the law. So even though I'm a lawyer, I'm on a panel of educators. And we're here to think about and discuss some of the other ways forward. How else can we create and protect the transition away from a period of violence and hatred and towards a more sustainable, peaceful future? And for the answer to this, I'm going to turn to each of the panelists to introduce themselves and to give us their one-liner, which has been slightly clarified over the past two days to be something be. more like a one-paragrapher or a one-pager, one <laughs> depending on your perspective. So I would encourage one-liners, but we, we are going to allow one-pagers and one-liners. I'd like to start on my right-hand side with our representative, Charlotte, to begin. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I want to do some sentences as an educator and teacher for history didactics at university. Um, and I want to start with uh, some remarks. Fake news, ladies and gentlemen, and so-called post-truth points to the fact that pot political and social discussions today are increasingly about emotions instead of facts. Even larger sections of the populations in their distaste for those up there are prepared to ignore facts and even willingly accept obvious lies. In the so-called post-factual age, it is not the claim to truth, but the expression of the perceived truth that leads to success. 
As a consequence of this development, I therefore consider approaches to history in general and especially to genocides as learning content that are primarily aimed at emotionalization to be highly problematic. The evidentiary character of the sources must be preserved. It is the sources, texts, pictures, films, witnesses, authentic places, objects that may trigger a reflected empathy, as well as they are the indispensable basis for knowledge and a horizon of values. Augmented and virtual reality can improve the accessibility and readability of historical sources. They are thus an aid to accessing the sources, but not more. If you soften, last sentence, the evidentiary character of the sources, the credibility of memorials is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much, Professor uh, Bull Grammer. David Kay, it's over to you for a one-liner. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for that first uh, set of remarks. I think those were really important ways to, to launch us here. Uh, so I teach law at the University of California at Irvine, south of Los Angeles. I tend to define myself by reference to my Californianess. Um, but, but before I begin with my sentence, I, I just wanted to say that you know I grew up in an environment that was dominated by, on the one hand, Holocaust education, uh, and on the other, the fight for the rights of the Jews of the Soviet Union. And those of you who are old enough may remember that in the 1970s and early 1980s, at least the American Jewish community kind of rotated around, not what it does today, but around the rights of freedom of thought, freedom of movement, access to information, and in particular, access to historical knowledge. And that's, that's sort of where I come from, in a way, more than a place like the suburbs of Los Angeles. Um, but that, those are my roots. Um, in the last couple of, uh, well, in the last decade or so, I've done a lot of work on social media and freedom of expression. And so here's my sentence, which is kind of a sentence with, you know, sort of, clauses and so forth. Um, paradoxically, social media and search engines, an admitted cesspool of hate and denial and disinformation, have also become history's greatest tool for global access to information, something we must harness for truth and testimony, something that legal demands, such as forced content moderation or forced denialism, uh, anti-denialism, nearly always, unfortunately, interfere with such access, and for which companies have a human rights responsibility to manage and moderate. That's my sentence. Thank you. Thank you for that very thought-provoking start on from both of our panelists. I'm now going to turn to my left-hand side for Emir Sulajic. Okay. Uh -oh. All right, I have to turn on the mic. All right, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, really honored um, to be here. Um, I'm here in my capacity as the director of the Severance Memorial Center. And before I give you my one-liner, and it's going to be a relatively short one-liner. I just want to say that we have a, a bit of a problem when, you know, we've been in Bosnia, we've been left with a very dubious legal legacy whereby if you were killed in Srebrenica by the Bosnian Serb artillery on July 8th, you wouldn't be and you wouldn't qualify as a victim of genocide. But if you were killed only a week later in a mass execution somewhere around Zvornik, you were actually a victim of genocide. Uh, whereby sniping children systematically and deliberately in Sarajevo is not a genocidal act, or whereby camps in Priedor are also actus reus of genocide, but somehow there was really no intention to 
lock up thousands, tens of thousands of people. So we, what we really have to figure out first is what it is that we're trying to protect. What are the facts that we're trying to protect? What is it that we are trying to prevent from being denied? Now, in my experience, as, and I've been a lot of things in my life, um, it's been a struggle, and it's been a, an uphill struggle, but it's been a struggle that that taught me, and I don't know, these words actually have been, you know, I've, I've learned two things. Um, well, one thing, really, that there is really nothing inevitable about where we are today, and there was nothing inevitable about getting to this point and getting to this reality. It could have gone in a completely different way. It actually was very likely, a lot more likely to end up in a completely different place than today. And, you know, my one-liner, based on my experiences, and I think these words actually have been attributed to President Mandela, are never complain, never explain. Just move on. That's it. Thank you. Shit, what's wrong with this chip? Um, and now I would like to move to Tally Nates. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll start by saying how moved I am to be here as a daughter of survivors. Uh, my father, Moses Turner, that survived six concentration camps in Poland, um, but survived together with my uncle, Henrik Turner, thanks to a list, Oskar Schindler's list, and that's the reason I'm here. And I think that it's very important for me to sit here in this courtroom to not only speak about myself as a founder or director of a museum or chair of three museums in South Africa or a historian, but also the niece of my uncle, Henrik Turner, that testified in the Freiburg trial in 1965 against two Nazi perpetrators, uh, Shemish and Weissmann from the Novitag, Rabka, Zakopane region. Um, one of them received four and a half years sentence and the other seven years sentence. Both murdered thousands. So for me, I'm coming from all directions and I'll try to bring all directions, not only my head as a historian or a museum director or educator, but also one that works in Africa, in Rwanda, in South Africa and around the world. So what is my statement? That we need a concerted effort to work together, underline together, in partnership, in cooperation, between the law, between education such as national curriculums, but also memorials and museums, between civil society, and also institutes of research and academia. And we are doing somewhat of that, but we can do better and quicker. Thank you. I heard a lot of echoes in and connections in the one-liners that we got. I heard um, facts over emotion. I heard um, what are the facts and how do we teach the facts in the face of the, the living internet and how do we explain facts in a way that captures some of that emotion from different dimensions. So throughout the course of the last two days, we've heard that education has to be part of the answer. So I'd like to start there because I think 
what you are educating on, the choice of what you include in the curriculum is really at the heart of this question. When you have a situation where formerly warring parties are each teaching a separate and distinct history, then I'm not sure that this is moving things forward. When you're teaching in a way that casts collective blame and continues to other your opponent rather than bringing them together, um, I'm not sure that this is moving the project of prevention forward. So I'd like to begin perhaps with Emir to tell us a bit about what's happening in Bosnia with the curriculum and then bring in our other experts to comment on um, what they've done that would be successful in preventing education from fueling future conflicts. Um, well, it's, it's actually quite paradoxical that almost 30 years after the end of the Bosnian conflict, we're actually right now just at the initial stages of creating curriculums as part of formal education um, on Srebrenica. I, I, I don't know about, about other things, um, but we are actually now at, at this very point, we are um, literally negotiating with, with ministries of education. And as, as Almir pointed out yesterday, there are 14 of them to negotiate with about what we get into, into um, the curriculums. Now, when it comes to the Srebrenica Memorial, it's a, uh, how can I say, it's, it's, it's the story of the memorial itself is, is the story of the activism and of the bravery of a group of women and, and you know, Munira being at, at the head of this group. Uh, but it's also the story of, you know, sort of institutional development and, and institutionalizing memory. And um, for instance, over the years, we literally were not capable of, we didn't have the, the capacity to do our own research, to produce our own research, to publish our own stuff. And that was only recently tackled and, and, and by, by Mr. Schmidt. And, and thank you very much for that. It actually allowed us to um, create, for the first time, uh, an entity within the Memorial Center that would be focused exclusively on research, on production. Now, for, for me, when I got there three and a half years ago, the real question was, as you said, okay, what is it that we want to tell? Well, you know, what are, so we immediately went, okay, let's see, you know, what's in the archives. Let's, let's see what's, what's ICTY got for us. And that's, some of that stuff is, is fantastic. And we did some stuff with some of our partners and it's, it's, you wouldn't believe the kind of interest that was generated after we published let's say, the, the, the uh, transcripts of the Bosnian Serb Assembly. It was just amazing that, like, almost 30 years after the fact, you know, the Bosnian general public was almost uninformed about the content of these documents. The same thing we did with the intercepted conversations between Milosevic, Karadzic, which we, there were, there is in excess of 200 of them, um, and they were all used as evidence in The Hague at the ICTY, and, and as you know, I mean, you know, there's actually, um, but it, it was interesting for me to gauge the reaction of the public, even the academic public. And a lot of people who were writing about Bosnia, I didn't even know that there was all this evidence there available, people calling themselves experts, people writing books and, and chapters and articles without actually ever referring to the archives. Now, I agree with you, there is a special power in archives. And the way, you know, what we bring to the table when we decide what we select from the archives, what we choose from those archives, how we choose to structure our narrative, that we do not do in vacuum. We do that 
with all due respect, with our own experiences, bring, you know, we bring our own experience to the table, we bring our own emotions to the table, because I actually, as, 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 as Honoré and I discussed yesterday, we are actually directors of the only two memorials in, in the world right now that are managed and run by actual survivors. And to try and impose this neutrality or objectivity on us when doing this, hmm, I'm not really sure about that. Now, for me, <laughs> there was another thing that was really important about, about, about the evidence, the, the documentary evidence. And it was that the number of witnesses who appeared at the ICTY is at least when it comes to Severin, so about three to four hundred, something like that. And that all of these people were in court and testifying because their testimony was relevant to a crime or to a certain individual's criminal or command, or, or you know, individual or command responsibility. But the fact that someone didn't actually testify to a crime didn't make their experience, as far as we're concerned, didn't make their experience redundant. Their story is still part of our history. So that's what we did. We went out and we started interviewing children, women, men and boys. Um, and, and based on that, we started our oral history program. And it's been one of the best tools in our arsenal so far. Um, the other thing that turned out that was really that, that, that you know was actually important were, were, were artifacts, actual physical artifacts belonging to people, um, individuals, whether survivors or those who perished, and we find them in two ways. And that's that's you know one of the things that we do is like literally, I literally worry that one day I will get a call that some of my people have run into a landmine somewhere. Because the way we collect these artifacts is we get people and we get survivors to retrace the steps of this death march from Srebrenica to Tuzla. And even 25 years later, we find shoes, we find clothes, we find house keys, we find all kinds of things that are, you know, they them, you know, they're not, it's not evidence of a crime, or not at least that we know, but they tell a story. And to answer your question finally, so we decided that, that our, the best way to do that, to educate, was to actually tell individual stories, to actually tell stories of people, to have our visitors, and we have over 150 visitors, 150,000 visitors every year, and we're not nearly equipped to handle as many visitors, I have to be completely honest. We need at least another 50 people. But it, it was this sort of, you know, we want our visitors to get acquainted with the victims or the survivors, to get to know them personally. Now, there, it's also a double-edged sword. And it's something that, you know, I've learned in my experience, you know, as long as you tell your own story, like sort of, you know, individual story, that's okay. But when you start connecting that story and start, you know, looking at it as part of a bigger narrative and connecting it to other people's experiences, you start making enemies. You know, if you start looking at all of these stories, you start making enemies. And, uh, so yeah, but, but that, that, that's it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, I could go on. Please, please interrupt me. You know, whenever you feel like it. <laughs> I am going to interrupt you there. I have seen this exhibition on the column right. that fled Srebrenica, and I commend it to everybody. It's very impressive, and it really does bring that balance of the overall picture and the personal um, story of many together. I'd like to pass over to Professor Bulgramer because you mentioned earlier about teaching history not being about neutrality and telling every dimension of the story. 
even in a curriculum design. So maybe we could move over to you for some comments on neutrality of history. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the uh, view to uh, German curricula, curricula is a very special one. So uh, um, to explain it a little bit, first of all, you, you have, you know, but perhaps some don't know, you have uh, to recognize that in Germany uh, education is a federal thing, so we have 16 curricula only in Germany. And uh, we all know as educators that um, education systems in all over the world are very national systems and also the traditions how to teach uh, are very national um, systems. Uh, if you look at school books, you wonder uh, there are com completely other standards of what is a good school book in one or the other country. But um, in my preparation for this panel, I took a few samples from uh, current curricula in Germany. And so the study of the Holocaust, we can say, is a binding part of the curricula of all federal states in Germany for the, the secondary level one in Germany, so till the um, students are 16 years old. And also, if they uh, uh, continue with school, they repeat in a deeper way uh, aspects of the Holocaust. But other genocides and violent state crimes are mentioned only marginally at best or completely ignored. And we have um, a, a, new, uh, a new fact is that since three, four, five years, we mention the genocide of Tutsi uh, and Herero, uh, uh, sorry, of Herero uh, and Nama, sorry, uh, because the German soldiers were involved. It's a story of colonialism and post-colonial uh, history. So now we get a little bit more involved in this genocide, but the other genocides I don't find in the curricula. Um, why? Uh, you can say on the first, uh, perhaps, um, uh, of course, in Germany, there is a special responsibility addressing the Holocaust. Uh, and there are also perhaps concerns uh, that teaching other genocides could distract from the German responsibility. And so we focus the genocide of the Holocaust. And uh, perhaps uh, also a certain fear that comparing genocides is not um, a German thing to do, I would say. And the second phenomenon is uh, that also though in Germany we have uh, the criminal, criminalization of Holocaust denial, I could not find um, genocide denial uh, as a subject at school, clearly defined as subject of learning. We talk about right-wing extremism, anti-Semitism, populism, and hate speech, right-wing, and so on. But genocide denial and the strategy, tra strategies of denial is not a clearly defined subject till now in our curricula. And uh, uh, last remark, um, uh, we could, or I could uh, also um, uh, speak a long time uh, about uh, the story of how to teach Holocaust, uh, because in Germany we now have uh, already a story uh, of how to teach the Holocaust since the 50, 70, uh, 60 years. And we have uh, the focus on the victims, on the witnesses, on the traces, all, uh, also on the victim groups, the different victim groups. Uh, and in the last years, also the questions, who are the perpetrators? Uh, uh, but by not losing the victims out of our focus, but also the question, who are the perpetrators and the bystanders? Thanks. Thank you very much. And I think that that connects very closely to the work that you're doing, Tali. So, of course, I come from South Africa, a country that is conf confronting our own very difficult past. Uh, and... and um, it's interesting that South Africa included the study of the 
Holocaust, Nazi Germany, also in the ninth grade and again in the 11th grade since 2007. And what is really interesting is that it's a curriculum about human rights that starts with teaching about the Holocaust, introducing genocide, but is then going to apartheid after that because it's a curriculum of human rights and apartheid started after the Holocaust in 1948, actually after the passing of the convention, after the passing of the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. So there is this tension of a system that ignored the past and went forward with massive abuse of human rights and crimes against humanity. And that connection in the curriculum is done. And that is in a country that is on the margins of this history. Yes, South Africa fought on the side of the Allies against uh, Germany. Uh, they fought in Africa, East Africa, North Africa, Italy. The very famous Auschwitz uh, photographs, aerial photographs, were taken by South Africans. People do not know that. So there is connection on the margins to this history. But more than that, there is a connection of South Africa to genocide history. South Africa controlled Southwest Africa from 1916 to 1990, longer than the German controlled German Southwest Africa. But we do not talk about that history. So we are still struggling with what do we teach and what do we not teach and how do we look at history. We touch Rwanda, and it's important to touch Rwanda because in April 1994, we voted on the 27th of April 1994, when already in Rwanda for three weeks there was a genocide against the Tutsi. Same month, same year, same continent, 3,200 kilometers apart. We have to teach about it. So it's a complex kind of teaching. It needs to be complex. It needs to be more complex, I would call. But I agree with you, Amir, that us as memorials, museums, as civil society, as publishers of books, creators, created or creators of films, we need to collect the testimonies, we have to collect the objects, we need to tell the stories, but we need to tell complicated stories. So for example, to tell perpetrator stories as well, because if we look at teaching about choices and about human behavior and about us and them, and these are the core things that we want to teach about, you know, the Holocaust and genocide can be an entry point to speak about these things. So the work is, is done and it's a lot of work. And I'll mention just one final thing that I would like to, teach, to, to touch upon later on. What we more than anything need to teach about and in today's world more than ever is critical thinking. How to read resources, how to listen to testimonies, how to look at the facts. Critical thinking, and I'll add one more word, nuances. We, we just don't do it anymore. And this is really, really key. Thanks. And I think this tension between merely transferring knowledge and transferring skill about how to understand that knowledge probably feeds directly into your work, David. Yeah. Sort of funny to talk about critical thinking and nuance and then talk about social media. Um, those, those don't really fit. Um, but I'm, I'm actually really inspired by, um, by the focus of, of my co-panelists on storytelling, because I think that sort of provides a way in to thinking about two separate questions on, when it comes to social media and, or at least the internet more broadly, 
and denialism. And I think there are two separate questions here. I mean, one question is, what do we do? Right, like, what do we do on our side, uh, you know, our side of promoting historical truth? Like, so how do we engage online in this world of fakery and disinformation and so forth? What is it that we do? How do we confront those stories, um, the fake stories? And then the second question is, what should the platforms do? And I think we just we need to separate those things out. And, and the, the first part, what should we do? I would say a few things. First, I totally agree. We need to be in these, in these um, forums, on these platforms, and telling truthful stories. Of course, stories of nuance, again, are not really going to you know, be what you find if you're on Twitter, or like, I don't know if anybody's on Twitter anymore, um, or any of the other platforms, right? That's, that's not, but nonetheless, that's where a lot of young people in particular, but others are getting their information. And so I think the first thing is that we need to be present in those places. And in a way, perhaps um, embracing the disinformation, I don't mean supporting it, but I mean using the disinformation as a platform for real true stories. Now that's hard, and as Amir was saying, like you need a lot of people to do that, right? So there, part of this, I think, is not about the state funding it, but it's about philanthropies and others, and there really needs to be greater support for that kind of work. But there is, there's a huge amount of testimony out there that, you know, in the right hands can be kind of cut into TikTokable, um, you know, uh, formats of reality, and I think we need to be doing that better, and perhaps the disinformation in a way gives us a platform to do that, rather than it just sitting out there in, in the ether. So that's, I'm not saying anything new that people in Holocaust or genocide education don't already know, but I think we need to be more active in those places just as a matter of educating the public and unfortunately finding ways to respond to the disinformation in ways that don't inadvertently legitimize it. And that's complicated. I think that's a real complicated question. The second part though is like, what do platforms do? Um, you might remember that several years ago, uh, Mark Zuckerberg in talking about Facebook and, and Holocaust denialism essentially said in an interview that, well, it's freedom of speech and so there's nothing we can do about it. I'm paraphrasing, that was basically what he said. It was something like, I don't like it, but you know, what can I do about it? The truth is the platforms can do something about it and they're often not doing things about it. And I think that the first step is for every platform to be basically taking a human rights approach. I mean, they have responsibilities under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to assess what is the harm that their platforms are doing to maybe it's the right to information, public education, whatever it might be. Um, so that's the first thing, do that kind of analysis. The second is um, they can never, and I don't think we should expect them ever to be able to fully root out denial. It's just, it's asking, it's not that it's asking too much, it's just an impossibility because any platform that tries, that, that content goes somewhere else. So platforms have other tools, right? They have tools of labeling, they have tools of providing context, they have tools of providing friction so that when somebody tries to access something that is labeled as denial, they get a pop-up that explains, oh, you know this is, this is the actual context. So there are things to do. Now, the problem, and I'll, I'll conclude here, the problem for the platforms is the same kind of problem that we face in all the denialism law that we're talking about, which ultimately, you still have to define it and ultimately, platforms operate in national jurisdictions that are not always the easiest places to operate. And the one that I often think about is um, Poland's adoption of its Holocaust law in maybe 2018, uh, where it was basically rendered illegal to throw um, 
the sort of the Polish nation into disrepute. I forget exactly the language, but but you know it's complicated for the platforms to make those those calls. But I think we in civil society and in, and in education, did you see that? Yeah. No, see, my same, doing the same, same thing. kind of thing. I actually, anyway. Now I feel like a kid um, at the dinner table. Um, um, but, but I think those are the kinds of things that, that the platforms should be doing. I don't think that the state um, obligating them to do it is going to be uh, much of a benefit, and it could actually backfire against the fight against denial. Um, but I think those are some of the sort of the ways to think about the problems. Yeah, I'm going to pass over here before I interject, but your chair will shrink <laughs> if you go too long. Okay. No, I, uh, I have uh, only a question to, uh, to Danny K, uh, because uh, what we know from uh, studies about history and social media is that um, basically we were hopeful that uh, this could be a modern medium of discourse and discussion, but it isn't because there are these filter bubbles and the posts are read of the group uh, uh, who wants to read the, the information of denial. So this is my first question. Uh, can we reach these groups? I think no, we cannot mm. reach them. And the second, um, um, uh, Telly said we have to, uh, 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 sorry, uh, we have to promote critical thinking and we have to discuss about complicated stories. So how you can communicate, uh, communicate this, uh, uh, these stories on uh, 240, mm. how mm -hmm. is the word? Characters. Yeah. Characters, yeah. Uh, sorry for this, uh, uh, in social media. So, uh, so the two questions, do we reach people who deny Holocaust? I think no. And can we, is, is there a possibility to communicate such complicated cases in this type of media? Mm -hmm. Um, so that is the moment for a show and tell, I think. Hey, David, do you agree? So 10 months ago, we uh, completed together with the University of Cape Town and with the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, a first of its kind research. It's available online on our website, free of charge. And that is about hate speech on social media in South Africa. We looked at TikTok, at Facebook, at Twitter, or X today, and we looked at anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and racism. Okay, it's show and tell, but you can absolutely mark it and look at it. And what is, to, to answer your question and to see, first of all, you have to do research, and not enough research is done. David, you are doing the research, and it's important what you're doing, but we need to know what is out there. And what was really interesting was that Hitler, Nazis, genocide was everywhere. It was in xenophobia, it was in anti-Semitism, it was in racism, it was on the left, on the right, and in the middle. And also animal language, snake, snakes, cockroaches, vermin, is there everywhere. Now that we know and we have the tools to understand it, we can do something about it. And we can teach sensitivity of how do you read social media. We can teach teachers, learners, students. We can uh, hopefully, and we have a, a project that is, is happening now, uh, we can hopefully develop machine learning of recognizing, because I can tell you, uh, David, that the annotators that did this and had to read the hate speech needed psychological uh, debriefing. It was hard. It was very, very hard. So we need to find tools, and not only in English, but also in our case, it was Isizulu, it was Isikosa, it was Afrikaans, it was other languages. So I just want to say that it's complicated, but we need to know first, and then we will find tools. We will not give up. Uh, if I may, I'd just like to, uh, to address a few things that I've heard here. Um, 
and, and I think it was it was also it was it was Tally and, and, and Charlotte who brought up this notion of um, what shall I call it um, talking to um, perpetrators, right? Now I, I I don't know. I mean, you know, we have different perspective here perspectives here, but for me, for from you know where we are, well, first of all, there was no. There is no bystanders in the type of violence and the type of conflict that engulfed Bosnia. The violence was large scale, but it was happening on a sort of, it was very decentralized. And the genius, if I can call it that way, of the Bosnian genocide, it was this decentralized, decentralized execution. Um, and I think that one of the traps that trial chambers and appeals chambers in Bosnia fell, fell into, uh, in ICTY fell into, was looking at these municipalities, because that's where actual, this, you know, these crisis stops, and you know, this is how the, the violence was very localized, yet it doesn't mean that there wasn't a big picture. And within this, you know, when you live in a small town like, I don't know, Bratunac, where I grew up, Zvornik, you don't, you, there is no bystanders there. Everyone benefited, even if they didn't want to. They got a job that they may have coveted or not, but they just got it. There were public auctions of goods taken from Bosniak houses. Um, everybody was you know, on, on the morning of, and this is something that, that Laura will know, on the night of July 13th in, in 1995, there was over 50 busloads, literally, of prisoners in the town of Gratunac. And some of them were held in a local elementary school. And that night was a kind of free for all. So any local Serb, could pick up a gun and go and do whatever they want. Now, when they emptied the building on the morning of July 14th, there was a lot of blood going on. There was a lot of blood. There were a lot of traces. There were a lot of bodies. Now, the bodies were picked up by the local utility services, the guys who usually sweep the streets, right? So they picked up the bodies. But you know what happened with the, with the school? Because it was late July. And in September, the school had to start. So they called, the local authorities called upon the, the women from the town of Bratunac to go and clean the blood stains on the walls and on the floors of the school. So really no bystanders there, you know? Now when it comes to perpetrators, my problem is, yes, I understand that, you know, I mean, okay, when you, when, when you do research and when you're in academia, and if you want to write a good book, perpetrators are where the action is, really. You know, I mean, let's be honest. But my problem is that in a context like Bosnia or any similar kind of conflict, it would only in a way help rehumanize people that I'm not at all interested in rehumanizing or even, if you will, seeing as human beings ever again. I mean, that's my perspective, and I'm fully entitled to it. I'm not here pretending to be objective. Uh, and the, the, the third thing that I, wanna, I, I want to sort of underscore here again is, is the power and the importance of the archives. You were talking about social media, technology, Tally mentioned AI. At a day and age when you can wake up and literally find yourself deep faked into an act of sexual molestation of a child, we need to be able to go and, and look at the sources, look at the, you know, the, the, the stuff, um, and, and, and tackle denial. Um, now, because the, the title of this panel is Other Ways Forward, I just want to sort of contribute here. Uh, it was talked about yesterday and the day before. Um, 
when I came to the, to, 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 to the memorial in Srebrenica, we started doing something that we call genocide denial report. And yes, these guys like, like to do that. These guys like, you know, to go out and, you know, say it wasn't genocide, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. But interestingly enough, they don't like being named. They don't like finding their name in a collection of statements, in a, you know, in, a, in an annual report that we put out every year. They, I mean, this year, the reaction was such that they actually started threatening the authors of the report. I mean, literally threatening, you know. So uh, that's one way to, to do it. I mean, yeah, okay, you go ahead and do your own thing. We're not going to engage you in, you know, the, there's, a, there's a saying in Bosnia that you should never struggle with a pig because it takes you into the mud and then wins your experience. Uh, it brings you into the mud and then wins your experience. But, but no, I mean, we will do our own thing. You do your own thing. Um, and I've noticed that every year the reactions have been more severe than the previous year. because These guys don't want to be named as genocide deniers. They don't want to be labeled themselves. Um, and we sort of decided, okay, let's take a book, let's take a leaf from their own book and, and or just throw the, their book at them. And it's been working, you know, if, if there was a, an actual solid prosecutor in Sarajevo, we might even, you know, see some, uh, some actual prosecutions, but that's not the case so far. So, yeah, but anyway, I just wanted to say that there are other ways to to take these guys on. That, 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 that's all I'm saying. So, sort of um, taking off from, from there, um, so Amir mentions uh, deep fakes. So there's, there's two things that I wanted to say, both about deep fakes and um, sort of the denialist online culture in a way. So on the deep fakes, I mean, one of the, it's very difficult to confront it, but actually, uh, technologists and the platforms certainly have ways to identify um, what is manipulated media and what is not. So one approach, and I think this is something we should demand of platforms, is that they're clearly labeling those kinds of things. Now, the problem is that that doesn't work for all kinds of media, and sometimes it detracts from the power of some forms of manipulation. And I know that sounds like I'm, I'm sort of making an argument for manipulation, but you know, manipulation, satire, mockery have been really parts of political discourse for hundreds of years. And so we also have to be cautious. And that's why like on the one hand, I, I agree that we need to find ways to address this, but there's so many landmines, metaphorical, of course, um, around this that could cause us to actually lose our ability to, to mock and attack the, den the deniers themselves. And I think this is one of the things that, I mean, we certainly saw in the Trump era that the thing that he hated the most was mockery. And I don't, so we just need to be cautious about how we approach, approach these kinds of problems. But so that's on the, on the deep fake or the manipulated video or manipulated audio, it could be any kind of manipulation side. The other part, um, which I think is, is interesting here, is that it's, it's not as if um, disinformation is, uh, it certainly spreads widely, but it's often created by a relatively small number of people. And, um, and there are ways to address those communities. Some is by identification. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, during a lot of the vaccine disinformation, I think it was the Surgeon General of the United States, but it was some government department in the United States actually highlighted that there were basically a dozen, you know, just about 12 individual vaccine disinformation um, vectors that were causing the greatest harm. Now, they were getting shared widely, but the, the center was through, um, you know, several people. So one of our options is to identify, and I think people do this. I mean, there are centers, there's a center on te technology and hate and, and other centers around the world that do this. 
But one option, or one tool that we have, um, and we're, and I mean, I think as a, like a footnote, we don't always wanna be defensive. We have to be on the offense here. And that's identify the source of the disinformation and find ways to address it. Maybe it's by mocking them. They hate that, right? Um, maybe it's by just truth telling. Maybe it's through testimonies. You know, the um, Auschwitz Memorial Museum, I, I don't go on Twitter anymore, but they used to, I, think, I imagine they still do, they would post a, like a story a day about somebody who was murdered, right? And, and so, you know, that's actually quite effective for just seeding the online environment with truth. And we, we can fight that, that battle as well. It's complicated, of course, but everything's complicated, but we have those tools available to us as well. I'm sorry, I, I, you just kind of inspired me here to, uh, to throw out another, another thing. There's one thing that helps greatly to tackle, you know, when, when fighting genocide denial, and that's solidarity among victims from different I don't know, genocides, different, you know, across generations, across genocides. And four years ago, the uh, Bosnian Serb government commissioned, well, they, they established two different commissions to research into the siege of Sarajevo and the and Srebrenica. Now, the, the, the Sarajevo Commission was, but they did it in a very smart way. They, you know, they got some like real crazies, but they appointed as head of these commissions two guys from, two Israeli professors. Now, one of them, his name is Raphael Israeli, he's considered to be relatively extremist, you know, far right even in Israel. But the other guy was really respectable. The other guy's name was Gideon Greif and he is a really respectable, I mean, used to be really respectable Holocaust uh, researcher. And, you know, he, I think he actually had a, worked a little bit at the, the or, uh, yes, and, and he, was, uh, he worked at Yad Vashem and so on and so forth. And then, you know, for us, it was when the report came out, I mean, the, you know, it was really difficult, you know, so, it was, first of all, it was a document of like, I don't know, several thousand pages. So how do you read a document that's several thousand pages and refute every single lie? And then out of the blue, completely out of the blue, Menahem Rosenstaft, who at that time was the, the executive vice president of the World Jewish Congress, comes down on them like a ton of bricks. He actually even calls this guy a disciple of Goebbels stuff that I could not even think about writing, okay? Um, and to me, that was like, you know, and the problem was gone, it was all gone. It was like, that's it. No, no report, no, not, I mean, it was over. But to me, it was just amazing, you know, this power of solidarity reaching across generations, reaching across experiences reaching across every single divide that you can actually think about, um, helping us out. So that's one thing that helps, you know, finding allies. Because these guys also have allies. You know, it's amazing to see, for, I had this great, I'm sorry, I was, but it's amazing to see that, you know, Bosnian, neo, you wouldn't believe that there are actually Bosnian neo-Nazis, but you know who their best friends are? Russian neo-Nazis. Okay, so uh, how can I say, so if these guys are capable of creating allies and alliances, why shouldn't we be capable of doing that? So, and, and it helped greatly, it was fantastic. I mean, and you know, Menahem indebted us for, for, for forever. So this question of solidarity brings up other kinds of multilateral and multinational efforts. What can be done beyond our own societies? Obviously the technology side is something that reaches 
beyond the limits of our own school curriculum and can reach out to leadership levels if what we're trying to think about is actually pre preventing the next horrible atrocity or the next genocide. So if anybody has any last comments to make, I'll move from this side to that side. Um, we just have a few minutes before we open up to questions, and I wanted to mention to the organizers that I don't have my second tablet yet with the questions from the online audience. So, so perhaps I'll start. Um, really interesting discussion. We just said uh, the allyship, uh, Menachem, is a, a son of survivors born in Bergen-Belsen, so you do have that connection. And I, I started with partnerships and how important it is to work together. And this uh, forum did exactly that. So congratulations to bring legal, civil society, memorials, educators. I mean, that's what we did here for the last two and a half days. Students, uh, brilliant students. Uh, that was that was fantastic, um, but leadership and, and um, encouraging critical thinking leadership is something we did not touch about. And in 2017, 16, 17, together with Aegis Trust, Rwanda, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, and our sister centers in South Africa, started a program exactly for that, using history as an entry point to look at leadership, at role models, at values, you know, at what does it mean to be a responsible leader and how do you fight extremism through responsible leadership? It's called the Change Makers Program. Tested it, did evaluations through the University of Pretoria of the pilot, trained the trainer, and this program now is in 13 countries in Africa and next month is launched in Asia in Manila, in the Philippines. We, we will work together, shall we try? Sure thing, sure thing. Shall we, uh, yeah? <laughs> no, but the issue is, let's start even small. We started small with thought leaders, community leaders, on the grassroots level. We didn't get here to the top leaders, but you have to start somewhere to change the heart and minds of youth leaders, 15 to 25, and then community leaders and thought leaders. And I just wanted to say that there is a way to use history as an entry point to raise the red flag, to understand where can you go if you go that way. And that seems to be successful in places like Nigeria, Mozambique, and, uh, and, and others. So um, as sort of a general, like a cr cross-border approach, um, I, I think that, first of all, I think that um, organizations like the UN, in particular the Secretary General's envoy uh, in the area of hate speech um, is, is essential. Like having kind of a, a central UN role is really valuable. But I also think there's a kind of activist element here um, that um, as individuals and as communities, there's a big risk. And, and the risk is this, um, the deniers have really quite successfully uh, wrapped themselves in the flag of free speech. And that's a problem for, I think, for confronting them in part because the, in my view, the, res the appropriate response is not um, to, to sort of get into the weeds necessarily of what they may legitimately say or not say. That, that's a debate that will, at least in that world, will look like an effort to suppress expression and to suppress debate. So we don't wanna go down that path, but I do think that those of us who are fighting against denialism have to find a way to embrace a kind of anti-denialism, freedom of expression theory. Like what is the theory in which freedom of expression, free speech, the ability to access audiences, what is the theory 
as to how that can actually fight denialism. Because I really believe that it, it can and that efforts to suppress speech will backfire, almost invariably against the marginalized, I think as, was, as Belinda mentioned yesterday, but also backfire against the very idea that we're fighting for historical truth and, and the public's right to know. So I think there's a, in a way, the denialists um, have, have kind of given us an opportunity to restate why freedom of expression is actually framed in Article 19 of, I mean, you knew eventually I'd say something about Article 19. Article 19 of the Universal Declaration and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Why do we have that right? We have that, and why do we have a right that's for the freedom to seek and receive, not just to impart information and ideas of all kinds. Why do we have that right? We have it in part because it's essential to developing critical thinking. And so if, as we start to chip away at that right, I think we also chip away at critical thinking. Um, but we also have it as a right for public participation. And we have to remember that part of the effort of denialism is to exclude voices from the debate. And we have to be playing with that in mind. And I don't mean playing in some small way or, or uh, minimizing way, but we have to recognize that we also have tools that are actually human rights tools. Um, how we do that, I don't have all the answers, but I mean, there are a lot of smart people here who actually work in this space of education. And I think that's what we need to, again, ensure that it's resourced, but get that, that message out and kind of reclaim free speech for like our team, um, not just the other side. Yes. <laughs> Um, I would like to uh, address uh, this problem um, uh, concerning the misunderstanding, I would call it uh, so, of neutrality of teachers in classroom. Uh, because uh, teachers not have to be neutral, they have to have clear values. And uh, teachers are committed to the cornerstones of our society and our constitution. And in this respect, they are called upon not to be neutral in this question. The conviction that all human beings have the same human rights and the conviction that people are worth different amounts, these are not two equally valid opinions that can simply be left side by side. Uh, I think uh, in the last few years, the term both sidedism has gained considerable steam. And often in the classroom, teachers say, but I have to be neutral. I have to listen to all opinions. And perhaps we should discuss uh, about this, that um, uh, to reject outright the absurd idea that every opinion deserves to be heard. If we found, uh, find a, uh, an absurd opinion, we should discuss in classroom, not to be misunderstood. If we find some... Uh, 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 on, uh, on Instagram, on TikTok, some uh, uh, genocide de denial uh, expressions. We, of course, we have to discuss and to analyze, but uh, it's not our duty uh, that every opinion deserves to be heard and gets a platform that the teacher installs. I think that's a prob uh, problem. Education and especially political education is not neutral in the sense that it is value neutral. I think uh, this is uh, a, a, a very uh, important thing to, um, to teach also students who want to become teachers. Because, yes, they say, yes, we have a constitution and we are teachers and we are, uh, the constitution is important. But I think uh, we should point out this uh, more clearly uh, than in the last years. Thanks. So I'm failing to keep to time. So I would really encourage anybody from the audience or online to stand up and give us a question. Please come forward. First to raise his hand. Yeah. yeah. I have a couple of comments, if I might. Um, thank you for the fabulous 
discussion. Uh, to respond to the last point from Charlotte, speaking for mis myself, but I'm confident other people as well, nobody is opposing uh, a teacher's judgment about what to teach and what not to teach, and to be very selective in terms of verifiable facts. I think we're talking about a public debate, uh, including on social media, when we say that, to quote the United States Supreme Court, there's no such thing as a false idea. Government, we don't need a ministry of truth from the government in the public sphere. Rather, we respond with more speech. And I'm really struck by um, the consensus, to me, maybe my perspective, that there's a lot of skepticism about the effectiveness of suppressing Holocaust denial or distortion outside of the context of the classroom where we're being selective about what we affirmatively teach. Um, the poll, as I recall, 50% of us, and I didn't even vote, so it would have been more than 50% if I had voted, said that these laws are ineffective. Uh, David made that point here, and I again want to emphasize a point I made yesterday that the greatest historians of the Holocaust oppose censoring Holocaust denial and distortion, not because of some abstract free speech principle, but because they think that is counter productive to keeping the truth alive. If I could just read, you know, one statement from Deborah Lipstadt, for example, she said, those laws suggest that we do not have the facts, figures, and extensive documentation to prove precisely what happened. Never was there a genocide more meticulously re recorded by its perpetrators, et cetera. And Raoul Hilberg uh, made exactly the same point. He said, I do not want to muzzle any of this because it is a sign of weakness, not of strength, when you try to shut somebody up. Uh, so that gets to the effectiveness, the greater effectiveness of counter speech, and I get, including on social media platform, again, Charlotte, uh, to go to your excellent question about the particular challenges that that medium faces, I really could not recommend more strongly this 2022 report from the United Nations and UNESCO, History Under Attack, Holocaust Denial and Distortion on Social Media. It specifically focuses on social media in great detail and rejects suppression in favor of more education, not because of some abstract principle, but specifically in terms of what is effective. And, um, as related to so many of the organizations that have been represented here, let me just say that one of the recommendations is that Holocaust educational uh, in organizations, museums, and archives should increase their visibility on novel online platforms, blah, 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 and it goes into detail. One of the advantages of social media is not only is it easier to get true information out, but it's also easier, I think it's Im impossible to do in other media, but on social media you can study and analyze various counter speech strategies and analyze which one is the most effective in particular contexts. Uh, there are about a dozen specific examples that are given in this report of very effective strategies, including those that are specifically aimed at young people. Thank you. I think Emir would like to respond uh, to that and maybe I, tally. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. Again, it's really about the context because when you walk downtown Srebrenica, if there is such a thing, and you see a poster of Ratko Mladic, um, it's a threat. When, because that ideology is not dead. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, the thing is, for the most part, and then again, I'm not an expert on Holocaust denial, but a lot of those guys are marginalized well, quanks, right? What we have in the Balkans are heads of state, foreign ministers, Serbian prime minister going on BBC and denying it. 
Now, if she was denying that from a position of, let's say, Conrad Adenauer, I wouldn't care. But she's denying that from a position of respectability. Come on, she's entertained by BBC. From a position of respectability, from a position of a prime minister of a country that has just spent billions of on buying Russian and Chinese weapons from a position uh, where she can literally um, order the Bosnian Serb leadership what to do. So no, it's, it's really about the context. You, I, I, you know, I, I, I've met Deborah Lipstadt. I've, uh, I have great respect for her. I have great, even greater respect for Raoul Hilberg, but in some cases, denying genocide is actually, because there's this sort of rhetorical device that they're using. It wasn't genocide, but we will be more than happy to do it again. So it's really about the contest, context, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I just, anyway. That's, that's, that's that. Just to add uh, 30 seconds, uh, something that was not mentioned, and that is uh, working with the courts, working with the human rights commissions as memorials, as museums, as educators, is really, really important as a tool for, you, you call this suppression, not suppression, actually work with, educate with. We had it many, many times, not only on anti-Semitism, on racism, on xenophobia, Afrophobia, uh, where the, the court or the Human Rights Commission, uh, let us work with. And uh, I think that if it happens more, uh, it will be a good thing. I'd like to call on Gregory, and then Mr. Schmidt, and then Serge Bramertz, and then to the lady in the back. Thank you very much. I I was struck by the comments on solidarity across genocides, across borders, um, and the timing is, is powerful for me. I just uh, published within the last month um, a piece called uh, Tran uh, Transnational Atrocity Victim Networking, uh, a new paradigm for international accountability mechanisms. You can find it in the, inter in the criminal law forum. Uh, Kai Ambos is editor-in-chief. I had a very fruitful dialogue with him while I was um, going through the peer review process and, and, and as I say, it was just published. But that point about victims uh, standing together um, and the solidarity across borders, it's, it's all about that. If any of you are interested, let me know. You can find my contact information. I'll share it with you. Um, but I was so heartened to hear you talk about that and I really want to see that. Uh, expand. I, I, I will point out that the idea for it comes from uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum pilot project from the Ferenz Initiative. Obviously, I learned about that through my biography of Ben Ferenz, and that's where I got the idea, and I think it just should be expanded. Um, and if you're, it's powerful to talk about that in this courtroom, you know, with Ben's spirit sort of hovering here. Um, so uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, um, in response to uh, David Kay and I think uh, Nadine, um, I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that, and you heard in my comments yesterday, that you know it's very important to protect free speech and have robust free speech. Um, I think that's the ideal way um, if we can make it happen. Um, when we talk about Article 19 and we talk about the ICCPR and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was issued in the late 1940s, um, and the ICCPR was negotiated in the 1960s. This new age of the internet and social media, as I mentioned yesterday, I think we have to be very careful about thinking about how things have changed. Um, and this, if, if I might say, and as an American, I think I can say this with a little more credibility, this idea of American free speech absolutism, I think we have to be leery of that. Um, and I don't think we should take off the table potentially reasonable ways of the state dealing with denial. I think that's something that we should all think about very carefully going forward um, and maybe come up with, you, David, you talked about a way of sort of reconciling all these things. Um, and I think 
maybe one of the nice outcomes of this conference would be to try to find a way, we talked yesterday about possibly some sort of model denial law that could maybe combine the concerns that we have in the social media age um, with the concerns we also have to protect free speech um, and find a happy medium. Because I don't think that the marketplace of ideas functions in the same way it did in the late 1940s and the same way it did in the 1960s. And we need to reckon with that reality. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you. <clears throat> I try to, to be short as well. Um, I, I, I only would like uh, to distinguish a little bit between the different areas and regions we're talking. If we, um, uh, Madame Bulkarama, yes, uh, there are 16 different curriculas in Germany. But if you allow me, uh, I'm not only referring to the Nolte Habermas uh, relativism discussion about Holocaust and you, you worked it out. No, in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, you have not three different curriculas as between Rheinland Palatine and Baden Württemberg. You have three different, two different positions about history. And this is the wrong issue where we have to combat. I say this to combat because this is one of my duties. So I think we have to work to get a common basis. So my question is about the international relation. Um, as I learned uh, when we last year, uh, invited in Prague with the help of the Czech government to have a session with historians about joint position uh, on the Holocaust, uh, on, on the genocide in um, uh, uh, Srebrenica and the war. Um, uh, by the way, with professor from Banja Luka as well. But I was very surprised to hear um, and had to learn that never ever such an attempt has been done before. We have the experience uh, in Germany under the umbrella of UNESCO in 1972. There started uh, 72 or 75, I don't know exactly, uh, the German Polish Schoolbook Commission working consequently in trying to get a joint view on history. I think uh, issues, uh, things like this should be. Uh, work to implement uh, in this network of international uh, knowledge and academy to this. And um, uh, they're about the, uh, as somebody who had the possibility years ago uh, with the program of the American Jewish Committee to have this Holocaust teacher training program, I learned there are a lot of differences in different US states, uh, how the different states are dealing with the issue, but not they have a a consensus in the basics. So I think how do we, it's necessary how to get with the basics, and this is about education, and you allow that I contradict a little bit. If you have people like the upper 20% just intellectually discussing, no problem. If you have people who are manipulated in as children already, unfortunately as pupils, this is the case in Bosnia Herzegovina, we cannot only answer with the idea of free speech. What is free speech, in my understanding, needs an information basis that I can give my judgment about, but they have no information, and this is which we have to work on. Probably there's not that much contradiction, but if you see the social media, they are definitely um, uh, uh, going in the wrong way. And so I would ask, what do you think about international cooperation? What about, yeah, about uh, uh, proactive regulative um, uh, uh, issues? I think we cannot live in, you excuse me, in our region uh, without having a repressive means to keep off, not like the Zuckerberg statement, you, you cannot use the Zuckerberg statement in Bosnia-Herzegovina because this is interpreted as an invitation of wrong uh, history and blaming uh, the victims. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, should we talk about the virtual white elephant in the room? Henry Kissinger, two years ago, wrote a book about artificial intelligence. I don't know whether there's any research already about how AI will affect 
um, historical and um, uh, knowledge and studies or information. I could imagine, I have no idea about this, I, I, um, not not very familiar with these issues, but I think we have to put a strong look on this, and I would like to ask whether you already have uh, some insights on this. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I have to respond to a few things that, that have been raised, um, but I do want to start, I know I said it before, but I just want to um, kind of quote, I tell my students, you could either get a tattoo of Article 19 or just commit it to memory. Usually they commit it to memory. The right is, um, is that everyone has the right, everyone enjoys the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, and through any media of one's choice. And um, so going to, to Greg's point, I, I often say, like, if I were going to draft the right today, I would probably use the same exact language because the right to seek and receive online is browsing and downloading and imparting is posting. I mean, I, I love this language if it's not clear to, to everybody. I mean, I think it's a really powerful statement of the rights of speakers and audiences and a right of critical thinking. So the right itself is clear and it, because it's written so broadly, it requires a very strict approach to restrictions. And the restrictions under Article 19, Paragraph 3, I'm sorry to get all law professory on you, but the restrictions require a three-part test. And this is not, I want to emphasize, this is not a balancing test. I hate balancing. I'm, not, I'm an anti-balancer. It is a requirement that any state that seeks to restrict freedom of expression has to demonstrate that it's provided by law, so it's a clear enough, precise law so that it doesn't provide too much discretion to the, to the state, that it is necessary, um, Nadine went through this yesterday, and that it achieves a legitimate objective, protecting the rights or reputations of others, national security or public order, public health or morals. So there may be some way to shoehorn in something like denialism into one of those legitimate objectives. We still need to meet those tests of, um, uh, of legality and necessity and proportionality. So it's a very high bar. I actually, um, and Nadine went through this yesterday, I don't think that ultimately when it comes to hate speech and disinformation, that the standards are terribly different as an, at the international level from really the First Amendment. I mean, the rules, you come out the same. In fact, it's the European court that I think has been more problematic on this largely because of the margin of appreciation, but that's another, that's another course that we could talk about, the margin of appreciation. Okay, so I'm talking far too long, so I just wanna say two sort of follow-ups here. So one is, I, I'm not, I don't wanna leave the impression that I favor a model denial law. I, I think going down the route of, of anti-denialism laws is a dangerous path for us to take for many, many reasons, some of which are policy, some of which are, are legal. Um, on, um, and I also don't think there's ever really been a marketplace of ideas. I mean, we've had gatekeepers in, for, you know, centuries, and now there's no gatekeepers, and it's, it's very, we're, in, we're sort of in an early stage of a new media. I think we have to recognize it, and we'll come out of it. AI is going to have an impact. When you mentioned Kissinger, I thought you were going to say something about war crimes, but instead you said something about, about AI, and I think... Actually, AI, it goes to, we talked a little bit about other tools of manipulation. AI is going to be a huge challenge. It makes it just like, because it uses deep fakes, for example. It will undoubtedly be a challenge. It doesn't mean that we should throw into the mix censorship, in my view. It means that we have to find ways to really educate people. And it goes really to, I think, um, what my co-panelists were talking about in terms of emphasizing and teaching critical thinking, how to analyze online media. Oh, and, and the last thing I wanna say, because this goes to Bosnia in a big way, there, and I really agree with Amir, there is difference from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and one of the problems is that social media is across jurisdictions, and there isn't really a one-size-fits-all. 
But one of the problems that I'm hearing from on the Bosnia context is not just individuals making stories, although your story um, yesterday was powerful about the students, I'm sorry, um, that, that your colleague mentioned, but, um, but we're, when we're, ta we're talking about state disinformation, right? I mean, the RS's disinformation is state-driven denialism. And that may be an area where multilateral state-oriented um, and, and even the, the high representative's role can be very influential and very important because state to state, I think at the very basic level, states shouldn't be in the business of disinformation. And if the Republika Srpska is, you know, different elements of, of the, the current environment are pushing that, that's a state responsibility issue that really, I think, deserves some of our attention. But it's not exactly... It's not the same thing as these other aspects that we've talked about of different individuals seeding this really uh, terrible denialist environment. I think the next person in line is Serge Bramertz. Thank you. Really, really interesting um, debate. Uh, two, two points. Um, I said yesterday that sometimes I'm wondering why um, Today, there's much more denial in the former Yugoslavia than 15 years ago. And sometimes I'm wondering, does it mean that people change their opinion? No, it's just that 15 years ago, they would not say it publicly. And today, they do it because they're getting away with it very, very easily. And um, 15 years ago, um, I was much more optimistic about international criminal justice in general than I am today, but that's, that's a different debate. So I was wondering, why was it easier 15 years ago. And I remember when we were looking for the arrest of Karadzic and Mladic, it was very much the conditionality policy from the European Union. At that time, countries in the former Yugoslavia were much more enthusiastic about joining the European Union, and a number of conditions were imposed by the European Union, and the arrest of the fugitives was one of them. Not sure if today, if Karadzic and Mladic would be still fugitives, they would be arrested. And I'm even not sure that if today a decision would need to be taken about ICTY, that ICTY would even be, be set up. Just to say that there are different moments in history, different momentum, and what we have seen in the early 90s at the end of the Cold War was obviously a much more enthusiastic moment about international criminal justice than we are living than today. Second uh, comment very briefly is about criminalization, and I fully understand the debate about freedom of speech and criminalization. And I also have seen the, the numbers, right, to say that 50% of people have opinion that the impact is, is limited or, or none. But, you know, um, it's also prohibited to commit murder. And in the U.S. and in many countries, people continue killing each other, knowing that it's prohibited. And if they are catched, they go to prison. So for me, it's criminalization means much more that as a society, we are saying it is not okay to deny genocide, it is not okay to insult again and again survivors and victims. And if you still do, there are consequences. The consequence that you are, is that you are prosecuted, that you are convicted, you get a criminal record, and because you have a criminal record, you cannot run any, anymore for political office, and because you will not be in a position of responsibility, you cannot continue manipulating children and young people in your own society. So for me, it's much more a reaction by the society to show that we are, as a society, not tolerating genocide denial. And, you know, in my own country, Belgium, that's very much the, the logic of why we have uh, um, a legislation on genocide denial. And that's why, personally, I will always argue in favor of legislation in this regard. Thank you. Um, first, on this side. Yes, uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anna Smollers. I'm a PhD student from the Netherlands, and I write my PhD on disinformation and how states should not engage with that and responsibility that may occur. Um, it's very humbling to speak, especially after the speakers that just came. Um, but I wanted to make a point about a different disciplinary perspective on this question, and that comes from social sciences and the field of like psychology. Because we see, especially among young people, that there is a growing resistance towards factual correction. The technological advancement that Professor Kate pointed out is so advanced that it exploits our personal biases. 
to an extent that people are no longer um, influenced by correction of information, including when it concerns historical events. So when does the point in time arrive when we have to say education simply does not have the capacity to adapt um, quick enough? I mean, it takes time to adjust curricula, it takes time, like you said, it took so many years already to come to the point that we are today. So can we still afford to rely so heavily on education and stay away from criminalization before we arrive at a group of people that we simply cannot reach anymore because they become immune to the tools that we offer as an alternative to restricting free speech, which, and I don't want to be cynical, um, I think is not the main way to go. Just how far can we go in saying education is the answer and we stay away from criminal law as a measure herein? Thank you. I'd like to take the second question of the woman who's had her hand up for a while and then we'll go across the, sorry, and then Betty, because we'll go across the panel. Oh, can I, or, okay. Um, I, I have a question about time, because I think one of the issues that this excellent panel hasn't reflected upon in this conversation is the issue of time. You know, I have this joke that you do not repair your kitchen when your living room is on fire. And I think uh, certain things around memory and education, you know, they become easier more, like they may become easier or more difficult depending on how much time actually elapsed between the events and the moment in present when we are trying to educate. And that's why, at least to me, it seems much easier now to talk about the perpetrator's position when you talk about Holocaust, which happened, you know, like uh, dozens of years ago, than when you talk about Srebrenica which is still very much the issue of present, not of the past. And I doubt that survivors of Holocaust would love to hear, the, would have loved to hear the perpetrator's position in 1950, for example. Uh, and then uh, there were excellent comments I cite totally with the previous one that the issue of having disinformation on social networks, also, also the issue of legitimization of, such, of certain you know, disinformation narratives. And the issue of having something in the law is also the issue of our moral and value-based position. The free market of ideas has been criticized as, a, as a basically a very Christian idea where you think that in the end of the fight between good and evil, divine truth is going to prevail. But what if we are not as optimistic as our American friends? What if truth is not going to win just by itself? I remember the quote of my, one of my friends, a Belarusian journalist, who said that it's not that people don't have access to alternative information. It's a problem that they do everything possible and impossible to avoid accessing alternative or factually based information. So it would be good also to hear your reflections on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our last comment and question from Betty, and we'll go through the panel to reflect on some of these ideas. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the opportunity. And thank you to the panel for um, those remarks that you've, you've, you've made this afternoon. Uh, I want to throw a spanner in the works. Uh, disrupt our thinking a little bit. Uh, could we consider that we might actually have genocide denial by silence? It doesn't have to be related to speech, but just by keeping quiet, not saying anything, not prioritizing uh, situations that are unfolding across the globe, we could be participating in genocide denial by silence. Uh, I was really pleased to hear in the panel that was before this, uh, one of the panelists referred to the importance of the responsibility to protect as a means of um, uh, countering uh, genocide denial. And, and the reason I say this is because we have seen the, not just the minimization, 
but the prioritization of those who matter in the international community and in the international criminal justice movement, we have seen what is prioritized. At last year's forum, uh, we spoke about the uh, aggressive war in Ukraine, and there were many, many references to um, also the uh, reaction of, of, of the ICC and how quickly the ICC moved in uh, into that situation, how quickly the 42 member states, uh, state parties to the ICC moved in to refer the situation. During the same time, there was a, a far worse situation happening uh, somewhere else on the African continent, in Ethiopia to be uh, precise. And so therefore, this is just uh, a suggestion that we need to think beyond uh, uh, the speech, and I'd like to hear your own views about that. Uh, uh, like David, I also don't want to uh, 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 balance or, or, or pit one situation against the other. They are horrendous. But our silence will mean that we will wait for the international justice, uh, criminal justice system to respond to situations, and they will not respond to situations, the responsibility lies with the states, many of whom have uh, uh, genocide in their laws, but we haven't heard of any uh, state party actually charging or bringing to uh, uh, account any of the perpetrators that are committing the crime. If we continue to say that until a court, an international court declares that there's genocide, I'm sorry to say we will be here after 40 years having this same conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to start on this side now with Tally. He's hiding. He's, yeah, and I'm, I have to say I'm doing a terrible job of timekeeping. My apologies to the Academy because you've done so well up until now, but please go ahead. So I'll, I'll, I'll be very, very brief. I started with a personal connection and maybe I'll end with a personal connection that is connected to the silence, to how do you educate today, um, to uh, many of the comments around denial is getting worse, you know, as we go. Um, the comment about uh, what happened in Germany 25 years later or 30 years later compared to Rwanda, Bosnia, and so on. Um, in 1994, uh, I was standing in line for hours to vote for very euphoric feeling that we, uh, you know, in South Africa uh, are, are so, so lucky that we can vote for Nelson Mandela, that there is peace, that we found a solution. Me, the, do the daughter of survivors that grew up with Holocaust all my life, did not make the connection in real time to what was happening 3,000 kilometers from my house from my voting at 10 o'clock at night. Rwanda was happening and I personally did not make the connection. So how do we make connections faster? And I'm talking about in education, in law, in international community, us as memorials and museums, as us as calling Ethiopia, you know, while Ethiopia is happening as your, your question happened. Um, and this is a challenge. It's a challenge and it's, I don't have easy answers, but I think at least there is awareness that we have to do it and we have to find the ways to do it. The alternative is to give up and I do not think that we are in a position to give up. So as war and conflict and civilians are being killed you know, in front of our, our eyes, uh, it may, may be in Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, may it be in Africa, in Ethiopia, the voice is rising and so much more. What do we do and how can we make the connections quicker? I'll just briefly um, address um, something that, that Mr. Bramert said uh, about the, the difference in denial 
15 or 20 years ago and today. And I think the main difference, at least in the, the context of former Yugoslavia, or at least Bosnia, is or was robust prosecution of war crimes. 15 or 20 years ago, these guys didn't feel safe in Bosnia. 15 or 20 years ago, we had a bunch of foreign prosecutors in the state's prosecutor's office. 15 or 20 years ago, these guys were at their wit's end. And what has, you know, because there was this like sort of cascading effect from The Hague, from ICTY, from, you know, there was like, it was the high moment of international justice. And it manifested in, in Bosnia in robust criminal prosecution. That's the period when we discovered most mass graves. That's the period because people have, and we have at least two prosecutors here, people have a tendency to open up when they're in a windowless room with a prosecutor facing the prospect of a long-term sentence. They have a tendency to talk. That's when we discovered and identified most of our victims. That's when, that's when we, there was, in 2004, you will remember, the president, the then president of Republika Srpska, went on TV and said that Srebrenica was the darkest page in the history of Serb people. And so, so, but all of that was the result of the fact that Actually, people went to jail, and everybody saw that people went to jail for what they did. And then, just like that. In 2010, Catherine Ashton Lenz in Banja Luka gives Mr. Dodik this beautiful gift in the form of removing foreign judges and prosecutors. And 13 years later, there we are. That's only just my opinion. So I'll just make two closing points. Um, the first is uh, free expression is not neutrality. I think that there's a misconception that free expression means that the state or that we can you know, not respond to lies. And that's, I just think that's not true. I think that we can, um, that freedom of expression can be unpacked. It means access to information. It's not just about the speaker, it's about the audience. It's about avoiding silence, actually. I think freedom of expression is about solidarity. It's about all of these different things. And I, and I don't want to sort of park it into a corner. It's actually fundamental to the fight, in my view, to the fight against uh, denial. And there are tools, as was mentioned. I mean, there's, there's a concept in psychology known as pre-bunking, which is instead of debunking, which, because I think you're right, I mean, the, the idea of correcting is not always effective, but laying the groundwork in advance through pre-bunking, through George Lakoff's truth sandwich. I mean, there's all sorts of tools to use here that are freedom of expression tools. And the second thing I just want to say is that, in my view, deniers want nothing more than to be prosecuted. They want to be prosecuted, please. They want the platform. We see it constantly where the deniers get prosecuted and then they have a political career that follows from it. And I'm not saying that in every situation that uh, criminalization is unavailable, where, criminal is, where speech is connected to incitement, to discrimination, hostility, and violence, absolutely, it's available. But we need to be cautious because it's also a political gift to a lot of deniers to get the platform of a prosecution. So uh, what I wanted to remark, uh, we have no time, but I would say, yes, it is very important, the time issue. So uh, the question whether memory and education time uh, uh, what's the memory and the education time between the event and the intervention is a really, really um, crucial question and we have no time to discuss this, uh, but it's a very, very heavy, uh, uh, heavy thing that we should have, uh, uh, sh that should have been discussed if we want to is, uh, discuss 
in future um, uh, genocide as a subject of school in an international dimension and approach. I think there is a lack uh, in discussion. We should continue. Uh, the other question, um, uh, are people no longer influenced by uh, correct information? This is frustrating what you said. <laughs> and in preparing the panel, uh, also I, I made some notes on limitations of education. Because of course, we are here educators. But uh, there are limitations, and I want to mention uh, three. Uh, first point, educated inf and informed citizens may also be particularly good at defending the absurd. Education is not a, pan a panacea. Uh, and second, uh, at school, we have the problem of staged communication with reciprocal role expectations due to societally desirable answers. So the teacher wants that I answer in this way, so I do it. But outside of the classroom, we don't know what uh, mm -hmm. the young people are thinking. This is the second problem. And the third is the, that the public expectation of history and uh, civic education at school is extraordinarily high. Um, history lessons and social political repair uh, instance is an expectation that a school subject with two or three hours per week cannot meet. So uh, if you read in newspapers uh, that there is uh, uh, um, uh, that ra radical young people did this or that, on the other day you read, what's about the history lesson at school? Please uh, do your duty. Uh, it's the history lesson uh, which uh, didn't reach uh, the, the aims of education. Um, so uh, this is therefore a task for society as a whole, and I think this is the reason why this conference takes or took, uh, took place. Uh, but uh, I want to answer at the uh, lady, there is no way out to search ways to reach people by education. We have to try it and we have to continue. And we have our small efforts uh, in uh, individual meetings. Uh, and uh, this is no question um, we can answer and uh, decide no, uh, education is no longer the way. I don't think so. Thanks. And I think I'll take a tiny last word just to say that this has been an incredibly interesting and engaging few days and I think a conversation that needs to continue because what Betty said I think is at the core of it if we remain silent then the deniers get to have the last word and I think it's critical that we don't stay silent about the darkest pages of any of our histories not about genocides, not about colonialism. It's important that we speak about and recognize the intersectionality, the intersectional effects on different people who have lived experiences within those events, that we don't forget about what happened to the women and to minorities who are not part of the dominant narrative, but who also suffered in these genocidal crimes. And I think the other thing that's coming out as a final word is that Raphael Lemkin's idea and the inspirational story of his perseverance and personal dedication is not going to be enough. That it's not something that one individual can in today's world solve that we need to work together as individuals, as museums, as educators, as experts, as states, as multilateral organizations, as courts and lawyers, hand in hand to support the vision of prevention and to live up to the promise of never again. And with that, and with my apologies for my terrible timekeeping, Alexander. Thank you very much. You can keep your seat for now. I'll send you off in a moment. Uh, sh shackles will be released anytime.
All right. So, well, uh, this panel put me into a bit of a predicament because so many things were said. I'm not really sure what to respond to or what to pick up on. So perhaps I managed to say something that we can all agree on, and that is that if there is something that we need, it is more speech, better speech, more education, better education, and perhaps most importantly, more of these stories by survivors and those that were there need to be communicated to people all over the world. It doesn't matter whether we are in Nuremberg, in Sarajevo, or in Kigali. And I don't think there is a soul in this room that was left unstirred by the stories told by Emir, Honore, or Munira. And so, again, let's thank the panel one more time for their wonderful contribution. All right, let's see the poll. The world is moving in the right direction when it comes to addressing genocide denial. 56% of the audience agrees, 44% disagrees. All right. <laughs> With that, please take your seats again. And I will say one more thing before I pass over to Professor Christoph Safferling for the final closing remarks. Um, one quick point of order from me for our dear speakers and guests, special guests here in the front. Please remember later on at four o'clock there will be a guided tour of the Documentation Center Nazi Party Rally Grounds. Feel free to pick one of the two tours. It's a one hour tour, a two hour tour. Uh, Dr. Astrid Betz is actually in the room here. She will be doing one of the tours. Please keep that in mind. Now, again, before I hand over to Professor Safferling, Ladies and gentlemen, this was the last panel. This is the last day, and as such, this is the last that you will see of me. It was a sincere pleasure and an even greater honor on my behalf to organize and craft this event, to work on this together with our collaboration partners for pretty much the last year. It was a great pleasure working with my team who's been working tirelessly the last few months, also now the last few days behind the scenes. And as my, as my uh, supervisor at the OTP used to say, uh, Cody, uh, never underestimate the power of the interns. And to them also a special thank you goes out. In any case, ladies and gentlemen, I will say goodbye to you. I will see you later, and I really hope we will all stay in touch. Until next time, in October, probably, the Nuremberg Forum 2024, we would hope to see you again. I certainly will. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good rest of the evening.